A question that's been asked more often lately is, do we dose our exercise programs appropriately? Who decided that 10 reps or 15 reps would be optimal? Why do we work for multiple treatments with a two pound cuff weight on an ankle and believe this is the ideal amount of resistance to be used? In this discussion on strength training, a most important concept to understand and utilize is the theoretical one rep max. We will discuss this in detail during the segment of our review of exercise and the older adult rehab patient. Our vision includes the provision of high value patient centered care and our mission includes a commitment to innovation and excellence. Using evidence based approaches to challenge our patients we should include the latest concepts in exercise therapy. The objectives for this learning segment are outlined and most important it's measuring the one rep maximum for any strength activity so that we could utilize it to appropriately dose how we either work on strength training for power or for endurance and how we could use specific strength assessments and movements that correlate with functional activities. Strength is the ability of a muscle to exert a maximal force through a given range of motion or at a single given point and it's also referred to as the muscles one repetition maximum one RM as a re review there are two basic types of muscle fibers type 1 or slow twitch fibers and type 2 or fast twitch fibers type 2 fibers are further divided into type 2A and type 2B fibers Type 1 fibers have low power but good endurance and are used during prolonged activities like walking and for maintaining posture. Type 2B fibers have high power but low endurance. They fatigue quickly. Type 2A fibers are a mix of type 1 and type 2B and are used for activities that require both strength and endurance. It is the type 2 muscle fibers that are affected most with aging resulting in losses in strength and power. Exercise can change muscle fibers from one type to another. For example, as a result of muscle endurance training, fibers can shift from type 2B to type 2A. Additionally, even aging skeletal muscle retains its adaptive ability. Research funded by the NIA has shown that nursing home residents as old as 98 years old have demonstrated remarkable increases in strength with only a few months of training. These increases in strength have resulted in increased walking speed, improved balance, and increased stair climbing power. The natural aging process produces a decline in muscle mass of 3 to 5% per decade beginning in the fourth decade NAIR 1995 with an increased rate of decline to 15 percent per decade after age 50 and to 30 percent per decade after age 70 ACSM 1998 this age related loss of skeletal muscle mass strength and function is referred to as sarcopenia Sarcopenia is present in persons otherwise free of disease and epidemiologic studies estimate the prevalence of sarcopenia to be as high as 50% in people 80 years and older. Although exercise does not prevent sarcopenia, it has been shown to slow this decline. Lindell et al. 1997. Resistive exercises combined with adequate nutrition have been identified as factors that limit the effects and severity of sarcopenia Evans 2002 research has demonstrated that resistance or strength training is the best mode of exercise to improve function improve quality of life and decrease morbidity in older adults strength training when performed correctly and directed by a skilled professional 
has been shown to be a very safe and effective method of improving overall health and functional status of older adults with or without chronic disease. For example, strength training is believed to be the safest type of exercise for patients with COPD, CHF, and or arthritis, as it does not require the amount of effort and energy required by total body aerobic exercise. However, aerobic benefits can be uh, achieved when the strengthening program is performed circuit style with 60 second rest breaks between exercises. In order to achieve strength gains, the muscle tissue must be exposed to a load which it's not normally exposed to, referred to as overload, ACSM 2000. Overload is achieved through an increase in resistance or an increase in repetitions at a certain resistance. When utilizing the overload principle, there is an increase in tissue tolerance to stress, thus raising thresholds for activity and injury. This means that a stronger muscle is better equipped to sustain stress without injury. Progressive overload is accomplished by periodically increasing the resistance. In the short term, a response is noted in terms of functional improvement, and with long-term use, the muscle adapts to those stresses, providing further gain. Once muscle tissue has been adequately stressed, for example, during a strength training session, it requires up to 48 hours to undergo a repair and rebuilding process. Without this process, the muscle tissue will not sufficiently recover from the stress that has been applied to it and will not adapt to greater levels of load. Ultimately, the repair and rebuild process results in larger and stronger muscles. When developing a strength training program for the older adult population, specificity of exercise is the key, as this population may have a limited tolerance for activity. By selecting activities that most closely correlate to their daily tasks, the exercise becomes more meaningful and benefits are more easily demonstrated through greater ease of task accomplishment. There are some clinicians who may be hesitant about, impl about implementing a strength training program for the older adult population, particularly those with medical comorbidities. When implemented using reasonable clinical judgment, it is possible to safely increase strength without injury or exacerbation of medical conditions. Consider the following research findings. The decline in the muscle's metabolic and force producing capacities are no longer considered an inevitable part of the aging process. Rogers, 1993. Aging skeletal muscle continues to have a high degree of residual plasticity. Toff, 2000. Frail elders responded robustly to resistance exercise training, which resulted in significant increases in muscle area and in musculoskeletal remodeling, Singh, 1999. Individuals with chronic diseases have long-term mortality benefit from strengthening exercise programs, Moray, 2002. Strength training results in increased levels of functional capabilities, maintenance of independence, and improved quality of life, Ellingson, 2000. Back extensor strength was negatively correlated with the number of vertebral compression fractures, land in 1985, reflecting a reduced risk of injury with increased back extensor strength. Long-term high and low progressive strength training results improved morale and quality of life with substantial improvements in walking speed, stair climbing ability, ability to rise from a chair, and ability to carry groceries. Singh, 97, Hunter, 1996, Vincent, 2002, Brandon, 2004, Heikkinen, 2002. 
Power training is thought to exert greater influence than other types of exercise in improving age-related reductions in physical functioning. Fielding, 2002. <coughs> Strengthening exercises uh, increase endurance, uh, endurance performance, and decrease blood pressure in hypertensive individuals. Hurley, 2000. Martel, 1999. High intensity resistance training programs, 85 to 90 percent of one rep maximum, two times a week, three sets to failure, results in the increased muscle, a maximal work capacity, VO2 max, and serum limp, lipid profiles. Hagerman, 2000. Strengthening exercises reduce pain and decrease function in individuals with OA. Bischoff, 2003. Circuit weight training for patients with CHF resulted in increased muscle strength. Mayorna, 2000. Strength training alone improved the quality of physical function in stroke survivors. Weiss, 2000. And last, in patients with COPD, strength training significantly increased their strength. Ortega, 2002. Gains achieved by individuals completing a strength training program can be significant. For example, there may be a 10 to 15 percent increase in strength per week during the first eight weeks of training, Evans, 1999. These gains, however, are primarily due to neurological factors, including increased recruitment of motor units and increased synchronization in their firing of motor units. Bem Bem 2001, Phillips 2000. Strength gains achieved after the initial eight week training period are related to actual change in muscle strength. Older adults have the capacity to achieve strength gains similarly to younger people and may achieve a two to three time increase in strength over a three to four month period. Frontera 1990, Frontera 1988, Nelson 94, Fiat Arone 1994. Finally, there is overwhelming evidence that only modest gains in strength are achieved with low intensity exercise, which supports the importance of moderate to high intensity exercise. Annenson 81, Larson 82, Mazeo 1998. Let's begin by discussing assessments used to identify deficits. The first step in developing a strength training program is to identify the specific muscle or muscle groups that present with a strength deficit. There are several assessment tools that can be used to identify strength deficits. Most commonly, therapists utilize manual muscle testing, MMT, or muscle dynamometry. While these assessments provide an indication of muscle strength, the results do not necessarily relate to functional abilities. In addition to completing manual muscle testing or dynamometry, therapists should observe functional tasks as part of the assessment process. This table provides a quick reference for key muscle groups utilized in select functional tasks. Remember, the idea is to address functional deficits specifically by targeting those muscle groups most likely to influence a gain in that task. Manual muscle testing is the most common method for documenting muscle strength. In order to achieve accurate results, manual muscle testing must be performed according to a standard and precise testing protocol. Muscle grades are documented on a scale of zero to five. The use of dynamometry can further enhance the objective uh, data gathered during manual muscle testing and can be used to measure the strength of any muscle or muscle group. The most common application in the clinic is the measurement of grip strength. Research demonstrates that grip strength is a good indicator of overall strength. Many tables exist which provide normative data for grip strength for various age groups for both men and women. Please note that all data reflects pounds of force. 
Consider using hand grip dynamometry measures as an estimate of upper extremity power. This table provides normative data for various age groups of women. Time chair rising is another strength assessment. Strength assessment using manual muscle testing or dynamometry doesn't necessarily relate to the ability to complete a functional task. The timed chair rise test is a valid measure for determining lower extremity strength. The test is performed by measuring the time needed for an individual to stand up 10 times from a standard chair without armrests. The norms for this test are summarized in this table. The arm curl test or biceps curl test. This test is designed to assess whether an individual has upper body strength required for household and other activities that involve carrying and lifting. The individual performs a bicep curl using a five pound weight for women or an eight pound weight for men using proper form. Record the total number of repetitions completed in 30 seconds. The norms for this assessment are listed on the table. The heel rise test is another functional assessment which focuses on the strength of the gastroxoleus muscle group. The individual stands on the non-dominant extremity. They may place hands on the clinician's hands or on the back of a stationary chair just for balance. They rise up onto the ball of the foot and then lower at a rate of one repetition every two seconds. The number of repetitions is counted and the test is terminated when the individual pushes down on the therapist's hands or on the back of the chair, or if the knee flexes, or when the excursion of the movement decreases more than 50% of the initial range. Results are interpreted as follows. 25 repetitions, 5 out of 5 strength. The ability to carry the body weight up only one time, 3 out of 5. If they demonstrate maximal resistance but unable to achieve even a single heel raise, two out of five. Please note these results are based on a study of 25 to 45 year olds and have not been validated in the older population. Toe tap test. The purpose of this assessment is to determine the movement sp uh, speed of the ankle. The individual sits with the knees and hips bent to 90 degrees each. While keeping the heel on the floor, the individual taps the floor with the ball of the foot as quickly as possible. The number of repetitions counted during a 10 second interval are interpreted as follows. Young adults aged 25 to 44 should be 47 plus or minus 1. Older adults aged 65 to 83 should be 34 repetitions plus or minus one. The supine hip extension test is another uh, testing position for muscle strength of the hip extensor muscles without placing the individual in a pl uh, prone position. This test may not be appropriate for individuals with a history of osteoporosis history of hip fracture or surgery, or other musculoskeletal conditions. The individual lies on a firm surface. First, the therapist determines that the individual has at least 45 degrees of hip flexion as determined by completing a passive straight leg raise. The therapist places both hands under the heel to be tested and asks the individual to press the test limb into the clinician's hands while the therapist attempts to raise the limb 36 inches off the surface. The individual is instructed to keep his hip, their hip locked and not allow hip flexion. The results are interpreted as follows. Five out of five maintains the neutral position of hip extension. 
four out of five, the hip breaks, but catches at any point in the range of motion, and the pelvis rises. Three out of five, good resistance is felt throughout the range of motion, but the pelvis does not rise. Two out of five, minimal resistance is felt, and the pelvis does not rise, and zero, no contraction. The one repetition maximum is the amount of resistance a person can overcome through the full range of motion of a given muscle or muscle group in a smooth and controlled manner for only one repetition. Calculating the one rep max is one of the most effective methods for evaluating strength and can be used to develop an appropriate strength training program. But just as we wouldn't be likely to perform an aerobic capacity test on a treadmill to complete exhaustion in an older patient, where um, it, wouldn't be a, it might be more appropriate, rather, to perform a submaximal aerobic test, it's not appropriate to have an individual actually perform a one rep max. So essentially, low repetition, high intensity activities call upon type 2 muscle fibers. And through adaptation, strength will evolve. High repetition, lower intensity exercises tend to stimulate type 1 muscle fibers and muscle endurance gains are a result. That's what this chart represents. Calculating the one rep maximum is not that difficult if you follow these steps. First, estimate the amount of weight you believe an individual will be able to lift through a full range of motion in a smooth and controlled manner. Here we're talking about 12 to 16 repetitions, but there are some calculators online that I will share with you in subsequent slides where um, they will only go as high as 10 repetitions. Two, demonstrate the motion for the individual and ask him or her to perform the motion. Monitor the movement to ensure it's smooth and controlled, pain-free, and without substitution. Based on the number of repetitions the individual was able to complete, select the corresponding percentage from the odvar holton diagram that's on the next slide. Last, divide the weight the patient was lifting by the corresponding percentage. This will equal the one rep max or one RM. Let's look at a case example. So in this case, Bob performed 11 repetitions before substitution or otherwise not performing a consistent full range of motion, smooth movement. He was lifting 2 pounds. 11 repetitions corresponds to an 80% estimate of 1 rep max. Dividing the weight, the 2 pounds, by 80% or 0.8, yields a one rep maximum estimate of 2.5 pounds. If the individual is not able to perform at least 12 repetitions or is able to complete more than 16 repetitions, select the percentage corresponding to the actual number of repetitions the individual was able to perform and complete the calculation as above. As I mentioned, there are websites such as exrx.net that have readily available free one rep max calculators. Let's look at an example there. <clears throat> Using this website, input the weight lifted and the repetitions performed. With this website, the preference is to test and retest until you determine a weight in which the patient is able to perform no more than 10 repetitions. So in this example, the client lifted 8 pounds for 10 repetitions before fatigue or inability to complete the activity smoothly. This calculates to an 11 pound 1 rep max. Now that we have this information about a particular movement, what can we do with it? <clears throat> the therapist will prescribe and implement the strength 
training program as part of an overall plan of care. As with any exercise program, the therapist may consider incorporating warm-up and cool-down periods based on the needs of the individual patient. These periods would include five to ten minutes of low-intensity, non-specific activity to pro provide a transition from a resting to an active state, or from an active to a resting state. When selecting strengthening activities, the therapist may consider training and strengthening for a movement, in addition to training a muscle or a muscle group. This may involve multiplanar movements that incorporate changes in velocity and environment. For example, you might have a person doing an exercise with their eyes closed. And this will provide more effective carryover to functional tasks. In addition, when the objective is to achieve muscular endurance, i.e. the capacity of a muscle or a group of muscles to perform repeated contractions against a given load for a longer period, using lower resistance with higher repetitions is indicated. Education is a key aspect of the effective strength training program. Many of the selected movements and exercises may be new to the individual. In order to perform the program safely and effectively, the individual needs to be able to complete a well-timed, smooth movement without muscle substitution. As such, the clinician needs to allow a period of motor learning. This may require as few as two or three sessions for some individuals, while others, depending on their needs, may require as much as nine sessions. As stated previously, the initial gains in strength associated with the strength training program are related to neurological factors and are not a true reflection of strength gain. Implementing a safe and effective strength training program requires the skills and knowledge of a licensed clinician. Adaptations will need to be made for individuals with significant comorbidities, progressive neuromuscular conditions, diagnosed osteoporosis, symptomatic musculoskeletal problems, and significant cardiac events which have occurred within the prior three to six months. Once the individual is established in the program, the clinician should encourage continued participation in strength training activities by transitioning to an independent home exercise program, a restorative nursing program in skilled nursing or assisted living, or a recreational therapy program as appropriate. Without ongoing exercise, there will be a loss of strength gains resulting due to a lack of activity. It is truly a case of use it or lose it. So specifically uh, where we're trying to get some muscle strength or power increases, we need to identify the target muscle or muscle groups, determine the one rep max for that muscle or muscle group, and then select appropriate strength training methods, elastic bands, free weights, machines, body weight, pulleys, functional activities such as climbing stairs with weights. Next, we need to educate the individual in the completion of the strength training program, including proper technique for completion of each exercise, proper timing for lifting weights or performing a resistance exercise, and the timing involves inhaling two to three seconds of lifting while breathing out, inhaling again, and four to six seconds lowering while exhaling. This is a little bit slower in terms of pacing than uh, we might see sometimes in um, strength training uh, that occurs in a weightlifting gym. Uh, but the technique uh, with having a longer uh, period of time during the eccentric contraction, the four to six sexing, uh, uh, exhaling, is important. That's where a lot of the strengthening occurs, is during the eccentric uh, period of time. And last, we should educate our patients regarding domes, delayed onset muscle soreness. They should anticipate some soreness, but not pain during or after exercise. Frequently, I tell my patients if they say they felt it and they point to their muscles, 
I tell them that's expected, that's good, that's what we're talking about. But if they point to their joints, then we tend to uh, back off a bit because we recognize that's not a response to exercise that we desire. Next, uh, frequency in terms of the strength training program should be completed two to three times per week per muscle group. The same muscle group should not be exercised on consecutive days. You should establish a consistent schedule for program completion to facilitate success. After two months, you could consider going down to two times per week, and after several months, one to two times per week would be sufficient. The intensity of the exercise. While in the motor learning phase, 50% um, of a one rep maximum for eight to 10 repetitions is typical. Once a person is in a moderate intensity phase, our target is 30 to 60% of a one rep maximum for 15 to 25 repetitions. And the perceived exertion on the modified Borg scale should be around a five or a six. If we were to work at a vigorous intensity level, this is where the weights would increase to 75 to 80 percent of a one rep maximum for eight to 12 repetitions, and the RPE most typically would be around seven or eight. So people are perceiving that they're working pretty hard as they're doing this. The progression. Progression with uh, moderate intensity, if fatigue occurs between 15 and 20 reps, use the same re resistance at the next session. If fatigue occurs after 20 to 25 reps, increase the resistance by 2 or 3 percent. In the vigorous intensity level, increase resistance by um, approximately 5 percent for each unit of five reps more than the 12 repetitions. Remember we talked about eight to 12 repetitions for that vigorous intensity group? So if they're uh, going 13 to 17 reps, increase by 5% next time. If they're actually going 18 to 22 reps, increase by 10%. If they're uh, going 23 to 27 reps, increase by 15% the next time. Timing. Uh, this program should be a minimum of an eight-week intensive program. And remember, we talked about establishing a home program or restorative nursing, uh, recreational therapy, et cetera, as appropriate. For muscle endurance training, the following parameters should be applied. Frequency, three to five days per week. If completing a daily program, alternate weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing activities. The intensity at a light resistance, 60 to 65 percent of a one rep max for 15 to 20 repetitions for three to four sets. The rest interval between sets should be 30 to 60 seconds. Monitor the patient's vitals since we are doing something that is endurance related, plus monitor the modified board, the RPE. Range should be uh, between three with the modified Borg. That's a training intensity, relates to a training intensity of about 50% to seven, which is a training intensity of 85%. The time, basically when we're doing an endurance program, it's to the point of fatigue. We stop when we reach that point of fatigue. And the progression if a person is doing 15 to 20 repetitions easily, then consider increasing the resistance by 5%. Again, the same parameters as we talked about with the power training, establish a home program, restorative nursing or recreational therapy as appropriate. Frequently, I've used this tool to educate patients on the variables we can use in exercise prescription and why they matter. All of our dosing is based on these three concepts. Frequency, how often we do it. Intensity, how hard we do it. And time, how long do we do it for. I hope you find this tool useful in your own teaching.
key considerations for a strength training exercise program. Use a slow speed without ballistic movements. The individual should be able to demonstrate the ability to stop on a dime without overshooting. Allow a day of rest between sessions. Use good form without substitution. Incorporate proper breathing techniques. Progressively increase the weight resistance to maintain relative intensity. Identify and address range of motion impairments as needed. Address pain management issues as needed. Exercise large muscle groups before small muscle groups. Strength train abdominals and spinal extensors at the end of a session. This will provide greater proximal stability when exercising the extremities. Strengthen in a balanced manner addressing both flexors and extensors equally. Integrate functional activities and of course keep it fun. There are three more segments to this series you can anticipate including cardiovascular endurance programs, flexibility and balance training, and other special considerations. Please take the time to go to the SurveyMonkey to provide feedback and claim your well-earned continuing education credits.